<clears throat> okay, let's continue on to this chapter. Uh, we talked about the tools that cabling professionals use to terminate cables, unshielded twisted pair cables. Um, however, even though I don't do that for a living, I still use those tools occasionally. Punch down tool rarely. Punch down tool connects the cable to what? What's a cable? What's a punch down tool use? Use for yes. It punches the cable, stops the cable from being pulled out of the connectors. It punches the uh, cable. What now? It keeps the cable from being pulled out of the connectors. Okay. So when the cable is split out, like one of the pictures that you have in your book, when the cable is split out and hooked into the back of a patch panel or a punch down block. Nobody uses that anymore. Patch panel, which I showed you an example of that. You have an example in your book also. When it's plugged into the back of a, of a patch panel, you use the punch down tool to, to insert the individual cables into the, uh, into the back of the patch panel. And it, it, we call it terminating the cable. It, it makes a permanent connection to the back of the patch panel. Um, it's really kind of interesting to see guys that are really good at this and they can they can knock these out and just go basically they'll set them up in the back of the patch panel first and then they'll just use the punch down tool and go bam 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 uh, where it takes somebody like me a long time to do that uh, but they do that every day um, once it's once it's punched down in the patch panel and once the cable is uh, What's on the other end of it? So, so we've got the patch panel back in the wiring closet, and, it, and the, the unshielded twisted pair is running through the ceiling and stuck into the back of the pa patch panel. What's on the other end of the cabling? And think about it. Patch panel in the wiring closet, and then what? Michael. An RJ45 connector, normally. Or, if it's coming into the wall, it's, it's punched down into the back of, a, of what, what do we call that little plastic? Yes. Wall plate. A wall plate with an RJ45 connector, like Michael said, in, inserted into the wall plate. You guys saw that video um, that we showed about uh, connectors and, and all that. Okay, so uh, here are the tools that they use. What's, what's that on the upper left? You might know? What's that punch tool? Yes. Get your hand up. Who knows what's on the left? What's on the left? Do I know? Yes. It's like that punch down tool. It's a punch down tool. The left end of the, of the thing is a punch down tool. Now that could be also a uh, tester. If you look at the end of it, I'm guessing that there are two RJ45 connections. You can't see the end on the right side that that it combined punch down tool and continuity tester. The thing on the right, not only um, that Land Rover device on the right, uh, probably is just a continuity tester, but I showed you or I talked to you about um, another example. Um, some of them, the more sophisticated ones, will not only check to make sure that all the cables are, or all the wires are connected properly, but they also do what? What else do they tell you? Anyone? Yes. How far it is? How far the cable is? The distance of that cable. Why is the distance of the cable important, Frank? If it's too short, what's the problem? Yes. You don't have enough wire to prevent crosstalk. You don't have enough wire to what? Prevent crosstalk. Prevent crosstalk. Uh, what if it's too long? Yes. It loses signal, and what is that called when you have a loss of signal, Michael Feast? What is it called? Loss of electrical signal, Josh Everly. Nope, not crosstalk. Quentin. Attenuation. Etch it in your hearts forever. You'll be asked that again. Question already got answered. What's up? Like 
I wired it up incorrectly and you don't want to wire it, you do the same way with the cable and you come to find out, well, it's just wrong. It's going to waste all your time. Could be. Could be. Okay. Attenuation. There you go. Generally, twisted pair cables can run 100 meters. And that's what the certification is for. If it runs, if it exceeds that without connecting to something else, what is that? Jessica? If I have a patch down, or up, if I have a patch panel, or I'm, let's say I have a switch, and then a patch panel, and then out of 100 meters, what do I have to have in order to go beyond that 100 meters? Some sort of repeater. It could be a router. It could be a pack. It could be another switch. It could even be a hub. But it has have to have some sort of repeater. Excuse me to uh, extend that signal and amplify that signal. Um, how does fiber optic cable? allow you to run farther? Someone who hasn't answered the question yet. Yes? I'm looking at you. Nah. Either one of you, I don't care. Um, I, I know it can run farther and it's faster. Um, yes, all of that. You bet. What's the, what's the main difference between fiber optic and uh, unshielded twisted pair? Uh, the wiring? It is, yes. But what about it? It's significant. No, 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 you don't have to look. You know this answer. What is transmitted on unshielded twisted pair? Data. What? Data. Okay, in what form? <laughs> I don't like being put on the spot. I yeah, I know. It sucks, it. doesn't it? Yeah. But go ahead. Tell me. What, how, do, how, does, how does the, what is the signal made up of? Is it sound? No. Then what is it? Uh, numbers. Yes, in what, but, but how is it transmitted? You know the same What? Electricity. Very good. Electrical signal. That's on unshielded twisted pair. What about fiber optic cable? How is it transmitted? Is it electrical signal? No. What is it? Is it video? Uh, light. It's light. light. Fiber optics is light. Okay, so light will travel farther. There is no um, loss due to electrical, electromagnetic interference because it isn't impacted by that. It's just light. Now, is there loss of signal? Absolutely. I have two types of, I have one type of cable that's used, fiber optic cable that's used within a building. And that's called multi-mode cable, multi-mode fiber optic cable. And then a different type of fiber optic cable that's used that we stick in the highway and conduit in the highway to get from here to South Bend for our Metronet connection. And that's single mode fiber optic cable. So they do have differences. Um, but both of them can run much greater distances than um, electrical signals or unshielded twisted pair. So categories of twisted pair, we've talked about this. Um, three megabit used to be used for telephones. Cat5, there's still Cat5 cable out there. There's still Cat5 patch panels, still Cat5 um, connectors and all that. That was rated for 100 megabit. What are your, capable, your uh, computers capable of transmitting at? Just like the, the Ethernet ports on your, on your um, computers, Taylor? How fast? More? Hover over the, well, no, 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 you guys are wired, or wireless. Yes? Gigabit. Okay, they're capable of a thousand megabit or a gigabit um, speeds. Okay, Cat 5e and Cat 6 are both gig. They're spec out at gig. Okay, so most offices today use gigabit speeds, but they have to have the right cable and they have to have the right connectors and, and all of that. All right, interference. Okay, we have. Interference between, well, what kinds of interference can we run into? Yes, Austin? Electromagnetic. EMI, electromagnetic interference, EMI, memorize that, you'll have to know it. EMI, what are the kinds of things that can cause EMI? This is in your book if you had read it. Aaron. 
wine machinery. You're right. Wine machinery. There's a reason for that, though. Quentin? Whoa. Calm down a little bit. What within a machine can cause a magnetic field? You're right. Yes? What within a machine can cause a magnetic field? Anything that's electronic, wires. Wiring. Actually, I mean, a very, I guess, really easy to think about example would be like, say, if they need the internet at a junkyard and they're using their magnet. Out every time you swing by, you got a problem. There's a magnet. Yes, awesome. A lot of times, the main component in a, in a machine aware that causes a lot of the heat mind is um, it's usually the transformer. The transformer is wound, it's a you know, wound cable and it pr produces a big magnetic field that extends a lot further than just the machine itself. So, so that if the, uh, if, the, if the cables are running straight in line with each other, they can cause, you know, as well as crosstalk. Uh, do you know who MacGyver is? Yeah. Okay. You are now MacGyver. You are now my, you are, your nickname is now permanently MacGyver. Correct. You lost the text. You are now MacGyver. Okay. You're absolutely right. So, so a lot of uh, machinery will have, transformers will have, part of their motor will include um, a magnet as part of that motor. And that's why we have problems in large, big machines. Big machines, large factories that have uh, those kinds of machines. What else? There's another very, very, very common. Um, yes, Seth? Uh, radio frequency? Uh, yes, transmitting of radio frequencies can cause interference. What else? There's, a much, there's a, even a more common problem in most offices. Um, things that can cause EMI. Yes? Uh, would it be like the street electric wires? Not so much because they're far enough away that they don't have as significant of impact. There's another one, even more. I don't know if it talks about it in the book. Seth? Uh, crosstalk? Well, it, caught, it can cause crosstalk, but that's not... It, it, this is something that causes EMI, electromagnetic interference, and it's in every... In fact, it's in this room. We have them in this room. Yes? Um, yes, still not what I'm getting at. Still not what I'm getting at. Quentin. Nope. Austin. Cell phones. Yes, but that, not a big deal. Yes. Yeah, so that's none of those are it. So let's not talk about it in the book. Otherwise, I'm sure that you guys would have recognized it. Fluorescent lights. The ballasts and fluorescent lights. Um, and I don't know if it's all fluorescent lights or just certain ones have magnets in them. And so what will happen is if a company runs their data cabling in the ceiling like they do, and they run it directly over the ballast, you know I'm talking about the ballast, the, the guts of a fluorescent light, then um, that will cause problems. And it will not, it will cause all kinds of EMI and you will have problems with your data. Okay? Big issue. So we, I mean, Running cable between these is not an issue, okay? Running cable directly over the top of those is an issue if it's unshielded cable, okay? Uh, another slide on EMI. Uh, any type of electrical device, air conditioning, motors, um, as Josh said, I believe, unshielded electrical cables, Basically, if you're going to run it in your house yourself or you're going to run it in, uh, in a small business, just keep it away from anything elect electrical. So, that, so in other words, if you have this type of cabling and you run um, your data cabling alongside your electrical wires, then that could be an issue. If you run um, your cabling, now, most of the cabling that goes into businesses is shielded, most of the electrical cabling, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, if you're having an electrician run the data cabling or you're having a professional company, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to question them about this. They know that stuff. Um, they know that it'll cause problems. If you're in an environment where you just cannot avoid 
big powerful motors or electrical magnetic interference, what do you have to do? Raise your hand. What do you have to do? You have your hand up, Jason. No. Michael. You can use shielded twisted pair cabling. That's one option. Usually not the best option today, though. Uh, the book may tell you that. Jessica. What's that? You could actually shield the machinery, yep. Not, uh, but again, probably not something that, well, you might. You might. That could be big bucks, though. It depends on the machinery. Anyone have any other? Yes. Can you run the wiring through conduit? You can run it through wire, the conduit, which is kind of like shielding the wire. There's another option. It's along the lines of shielded twisted pair cabling, but we don't use that. We use something else instead. I know that MacGyver knows this. Q. You create a Faraday cage. No. Oh, well, that's, what, that's actually close to what Jessica was talking about. Yes, and if you're worried about it impacting you, you put an aluminum foil hat on. Come on, come on, there's another option for data cabling besides shielded twisted pair. One more hint. What is it? No idea? I'm not looking at you. No idea? What? Huh? Yes. Could you use fiber optic? Fiber optic cabling. Thank you very much. You knew that, right? No, I told you that. In your notes. Okay. So fiber optic cabling. So as an example, you have a front in a lot of companies, small businesses, you'll have a front office where the people are working on the accounting and taking orders and, and salespeople and all this other kind of stuff. And then you may have an entire manufacturing plant that's actually doing and making stuff. That's where you have all the interference. You've got huge machinery in it, uh, whatever. And then in the back of it, you may have shipping and receiving where they have to have com com uh, computers again. Uh, again, they're, they're using wiring. So you gotta get from one end of the plant to the other. Maybe it's within 100 meters, so you don't have to worry about the distance, but if you've got all of this electromagnetic interference in between, you still have to be able to run the cable back to shipping and receiving and such. So fiber optic cabling is a, a good, um, uh, answer for that. In addition to that, fiber optic cabling is, in many, many businesses, fiber optic cabling is an option because that huge manufacturing facility exceeds 100 meters, and so you have to get from one end of the plant to the other. And instead of putting a switch in the ceiling someplace, which you have, it's tough to get to, instead you just one time uh, run the fiber optic from one end to the other. What's the downside of running fiber optic cable? All right, hands all over the place. Yes, price. Price. It's more expensive. However, it's not nearly as expensive as it used to be. We ran a, a one of my customers, uh, regular customers, um, has uh, a building that they put on an extension, uh, put on a, an addition to, and so they added like 50 users back in the back end of this new addition, but all their servers and all their other office people were in the front. Well. Ten years ago, they ran fiber optics between the two, and, they, and keep in mind that you have to have the transceivers into the switches. This fiber optic cable doesn't go into an RJ45 connection. It instead goes into a fiber optic, like an ST connector or something like that. So ten years ago, when they ran the fiber between the two locations, uh, the ST connect or the, the fiber connectors plus the cabling plus the installation was about fifteen thousand dollars. We did it a couple years ago for an additional connection because we added some more and it, the, the entire thing with a much faster connection was only about $2,500 with labor, fiber, fiber and uh, electronics on either end. So that, that's good stuff. Um, okay. Talked about shielded twisted pair cabling briefly. This has an aluminum shielding on the outside. Okay, aluminum shielding on the outside so that you can run a magnet right next to it, God bless you, and nothing happens. It's not going to disturb it a bit. So you can run shielded twisted pair. But again, by the time you buy this cabling and install it, because it's more difficult to install, um, you may want to consider fiber optics instead. Because then you get the additional benefits of fiber optics. 
Okay, uh, someone else brought up RFI, radio frequency uh, interference. Um, you can, in, an, an example of this, here's an example, great example. Um, I have a business associate that puts up uh, cabling, or I'm sorry, wiring, wireless connections between plants. Okay, um, a local company had decided they were going to do their own, and so without checking with anyone else, they went out on the market, bought this huge transmitter, and they did their own wireless network between two other plants. So as an example, this guy had a, had a plant here and a plant here with this huge, powerful transmitter on either end. They went major overkill, and my client, or my business partner, already had a wireless connection from this end to this end, so they were basically crossing over each other. They had from this end to this end, but they were within the realm of reason. They had a, a frequency that they were using that was approved and everything else. Uh, they didn't have any amplifiers on it or anything else. Well, when this other company put in their major transmitters, it stepped all over the signal that was had been in place for a couple of years prior to that. Nobody could figure out what it was until they got the proper equipment and realized that um, periodically this company, this other company um, added this additional connection and that was the problem with it. Data emanation. We don't use this very often. Um, used to be a risk because we used to use almost nothing but coaxial cable. Not a huge risk, just know what the term means, data emanation. Crosstalk we've already talked about. If, it, if the, uh, uh, this can happen uh, not only if the wires are not properly formed, which if you buy preformed wires, you know, nobody does this themselves anymore, you buy proper cabling. You normally don't have the problem if the cabling is run in bundles. But what you might have, the, might have the problem is, remember I told you before that you have, you only strip, like when you're putting the ends on the cable, you only strip back um, enough that uh, you can separate the wires and punch them down into the, into the adapter. If you strip it back anymore and separate them, and, and so you have maybe that much of cable that's separated before it gets into the RJ45 connection, then you've got a problem, you can have a most likely will have a problem with crosstalk, signal loss. Um, a lot of people, companies that try to do patch panels on their own, they'll put a patch panel in, they'll strip it back way too far, they'll punch them down, and they'll have major crosstalk uh, at the patch panel. That's the most common occurrence of crosstalk, is at the patch, patch panel. Um, so the signal jumps from one, one connection to the other. Near end cross, know the difference between near and far end crosstalk. A lot of times you'll hear an electrician or a data guy talk about near and far end crosstalk. Um, near end um, would be, for example, a single cable that you've stripped out and separated the wires too far back, and now you've got crosstalk between the individual wires. Um, far end crosstalk is normally going to happen at like the patch panel when you've got between. Uh, different wire or different cables that are that are punched down at the patch panel. All right, now here is the most important, the most important slide in this entire entire chapter: plenum versus non-plenum. Okay, a plenum-rated cable. Well, let's back up. What's a, what's a regular, just standard, like the cables I brought out, UTP cable, we talked about this earlier. What's it, what is that outer um, coating? What is that outer plastic made of? Jessica. PVC, polyvinyl chloride. What'd you say, chloride? Okay, PVC, bottom line is PVC. PVC, what's wrong with PVC? Um, no? Yes? When it burns or it loses the chemical, 
when it burns, it releases a, a toxic chemical that can kill you. Okay? So, if the air ducts, you know, in, in every room we have air ducts. Okay? In every room, in most businesses, in most companies, in most houses, we have air ducts. And that circulates the air for the heating system or the ventilation system, and it, it, it basically contains the air that's being forced from one end of the building to the other, or throughout the building. So, do you think that it makes sense? I mean, a lot of people would think, if I've got cabling, or if I've got a, an air duct that goes from one end of the house to the other, that's almost like conduit. And it's easy to run my cable. I don't have to go around two by fours, and I don't have to go around floor joists and, and all those kinds of things. So they run their data cabling through the air ducts. What's the problem with that? What's the problem with that? MacGyver. If the fire starts and starts melting down those cables, you're going to get all these toxic fumes being pumped through the entire place. Through the entire place, instead of being isolated in one location. So if it's you know, if, it's, if the cabling is on the outside of the wall, as an example, in this room, it would never be, but it could be in conduit like you see on the, the uh, or wiring mold, uh, wire molding on the side of the walls. If it's on the outside, the only people that are going to die from those toxic fumes are the ones in the room. And chances are they know that, they're, uh, they know that, that there's a fire, okay? The, raise your hand if you have a question and just wait a second, okay? So, if, however, there's a fire on one end of the plant and they're using these air ducts, these plenums, to run their data cabling, then that, those toxic fumes could be forced into another area of the plant or worse, every area of the plant or building and kill everybody before you even know there's a fire. Okay, so that's why we have plenum grade cabling with the cabling is in the air ducts if it needs to be, or if the, the heating, ventilation, and cooling system is such that you cannot isolate um, uh, a fire like that into one area, and instead it's trans the, the toxic fumes are transmitted, then you need plenum graded, plenum grade or plenum graded cables. Now, Austin, what was your question? Um, so that more of a comment, uh, TV, the TV's been burned out like Last summer, we, I was doing HVAC with my stepdad, and we put in like three water heaters in one day, and so we had a bunch of pieces of PVC, and we didn't we just put them in some guy's garbage can, so we took them home in the box, and we had a bonfire later that day, so we just threw them on there, and we had to like go away because it smelled so bad. That explains so much. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably pretty dangerous. Yeah. PVC like burns will emit toxic fumes. Yeah, so it, it threw it down, but... Okay. All right, oh, so it's just your neighbors. Uh, okay. okay. All right, questions about plenum. Well, the house next door wasn't bad. Okay, so plenum grade cabling is cabling that will not burn and emit toxic fumes. Plenum grade cabling, but what's wrong with plenum? Why not just install it everywhere? Christopher. It's expensive. It's expensive. It's more expensive than, than non plenum. And so, here, here's another thing. I have known of businesses that have had a fire inspection and that have had a fire inspection and the fire inspector shut their business down until they replaced all their data cable. Okay, take your break. Can we turn off the, the camera? Okay. Somebody calling? Yeah. Yeah. Is PVC extremely easy?